The Institute of the Americas is honored to host Jessica Bedoya, the Inter-American Inter Development Bank's chief, chief of staff and chief strategy officer, uh, to our first hybrid forum. Jessica Bedoya um, is the primary advisor to the president of the IDB on institutional strategy and investment policy. She has extensive leadership experience in international affairs and policymaking, and a track record successfully coordinating with the private sector across Latin America and the Caribbean. Prior to joining the IDB, Jessica spent 15 years in the US government, most recently as the managing director for Western Hemisphere and senior advisor to the CEO of the US International Development Finance Corporation, the DFC. At the DFC, Jessica led strategic business development in Latin America and the Caribbean and identified finance and investment opportunities up to a billion dollars in agriculture, infrastructure, and technology. From 2018 to 2020, Jessica served as the Deputy Senior Director for Western, Hemisphere, Western Hemispheric Affairs at the NSC, where she created and developed and directed U.S. policy priorities in Latin America. Jessica strengthened bilateral relationships by increasing the U.S. presence in the region and expanding economic growth opportunities. In addition, as a regional expert, she advised the National Security Advisor and led execution of the America Crece uh, program, which catalyzed private sector investment in Latin America. Prior to her time at the NSC, Jessica served as the foreign policy and U.S. intelligence community advisor, informing them and advising and implementing policy across the Western Hemisphere. She's also mobilized international support for key initiatives by working with leaders from governments and the private sector. She has worked at the U.S. Embassy in Bogota and has also worked in, in Haiti and the Eastern Caribbean. Jessica holds a Bachelor of Arts in International Pol uh, Politics and International Economics from George Washington University and a Master's in World Politics from Catholic University of America, as well as have, having studied political science at the Sorbonne in Paris. Jessica speaks English, Spanish, and French and has parents um, from Colombia as well as Ecuador. At this time, I'm pleased to um, introduce Jessica, who will share her perspectives on this growing challenge we face today on reconciling um, climate change, the, the move to net zero, and energy transition. Jessica, take it away. I want to thank you, Richard, and the Institute for this platform to be able to share here on the West Coast what we are trying to do from the East Coast all the way south into Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, today, the issue is Latin American energy project finance and the path to net zero. And I think that this could not be a more timely session because we at the IDB are trying to focus now on how we can do better in the region in terms of project finance and how we can get countries to net zero because that's the way forward, that's the wave of the future. We're looking at climate change as an issue of our generation and because of that, what I'd like to do is start first with a little bit of context of what we're seeing from the bank in the region in terms of trends and, and highlight what we're trying to do to advance these efforts. Now, even before the pandemic, the region, Latin America and the Caribbean, was grappling with a lot of significant challenges. Those included inequality, a lack of confidence in governments, budget deficits, and a need for much more investment in social services, infrastructure, and energy diversification. In late 2019, and I know this may seem like a stretch, but we have to go back to 2019 because COVID had frozen, has frozen time. But I had firsthand experience the millions of people clamoring on the streets in Latin America and countries all the way from Ecuador to Chile in response to hikes in transportation costs, wage decreases, and disparate access to public services. Then came COVID, which exacerbated those problems, and today has created an economic crisis not seen in nearly 200 years in the region. And now a few sobering statistics to paint that picture of what we're experiencing in Latin America and the Caribbean today. 8% of the world's population, yet almost a third of all of the COVID-19 deaths globally. That's about one and a half million people that we've lost. And then there's a loss of livelihoods. We estimate that 52 million people have fallen out of the middle class in the last year, and over 30 million have lost full-time jobs. What does that mean? Higher rates of labor informality, a more disaffected former middle class in the region. The pandemic has been especially hard on women and children. 100 million kids were locked out of classrooms, and the UN recently reported that two in three children are still not back in school. And I can't go without saying a, a little bit about women in the region, which we view as the motor. They will be the economic motor towards recovery and recuperation in the long term. But right now, they're facing a zero-sum choice. Women in the region have to decide, either I stay home and take care of my parents or my grandparents or my children, and I leave my job. 
And the, what's the choice? I have to leave my job because these responsibilities are calling to me. And that is unacceptable for us at the Inter-American Development Bank. Now, as it relates to today's discussion on Latin America and the Caribbean and project finance, let's talk about climate change. Climate change, like I said, is the issue of this generation. And for those of us who have observed Latin America, have been the students of the region for most of our careers, we are seeing the adverse impact of climate change to the region today. Polls right now show that eight out of 10 people in Latin America and the Caribbean are worried about climate change. And there's a significant reason to worry. Our colleagues at the World Bank recently estimated that by 2030, climate change could push over 132 million people off the cliff into extreme poverty. And that's a significant number because most of those people will be in the developing world. Now, in our region, climate change looks like extreme weather events, including severe droughts, flooding, hurricanes, that have continued to upend the region throughout the pandemic. And countries still need the support, technical and financial, to build resilience, to adapt and to mitigate all of that damage. Last year was among the three hottest recorded in the history of Central America and the Caribbean. Record hit waves hit parts of South America and a drought in the Southern Amazon region was the worst in 50 years. And so now, what is the impact? We are seeing reduced crop yields and agricultural output, slowed if not paralyzed shipping because of low water levels, and impacts of the supply of everything from beef to avocados to coffee beans and corn, all of which come from the breadbasket that is Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, we're looking, we're looking at any media outlet today, what are the headlines saying? Stories about burgeoning energy crises that, spanning, that are spanning continents and countries. And this is a significant trend. And now we must think about this. If the industrialized and developed worlds are suffering from an energy crisis today, what is the impact on the developing world? What is the impact on the Latin American Caribbean region? They are the most vulnerable. We had almost 7 million people whose lives were disrupted by Hurricanes Eta and Nyota just last fall. Those storms caused over $6 billion in damages in Central America alone. The ongoing occurrence of events like this is akin to yet another pandemic, one that all of us have to confront. At the IDB, we reviewed these issues, and internally we've assessed that if we do not keep global warming to under 2 degrees centigrade, we estimate that the annual damage for climate change could total upwards of $100 billion just in our region. And if that isn't a wake-up call, we don't know what is. Now, doing things differently is exactly what we are now doing at the IDB. It's why I am delighted to be here with you today. At the bank, we are seeing the challenges, but we want to take action. And the first step we took is create the Vision 2025, which is our blueprint for achieving recovery and sustainable development in the Americas. Our Vision 2025 outlines five key priority areas for reinvestment, including supply chains and regional integration the support for small and medium-sized enterprises, digitalization, gender equity and inclusion, and of course, climate change, which is central to all of the work that we're doing. We know that when we invest in clean energy and ecosystem conservation, we not only achieve faster growth, but we enable growth that is sustainable and that benefits even more people. For us, resilience and a net zero future is the best bet. For example, we're seeing this in Costa Rica with their national decarbonization plan, which I'm proud that the bank did a lot of significant work with the government of Costa Rica to advance. This plan alone could yield $41 billion in net benefits within 30 years through savings in energy, improvements in ecosystem services, and agricultural yields. In Peru, we estimate that achieving carbon neutrality could create upwards of $140 billion in net benefits by 2050 by transforming transportation, energy, and agricultural sectors. Clean energy stimulus programs also generate up to five times more jobs for every dollar invested than fossil fuel-based energy programs. So we know that going green is the right thing to do for the environment, for the economy, and for the people of the region. So how do we go green most effectively? The key to all of this is public policy, which is a top catalyst for energy investment anywhere. More than 70% of energy infrastructure investment worldwide is driven by government policies. Public policy is critical to creating the type of long-term stable and enabling investment environment required to unleash all the private capital that is out there. The pandemic forced governments to design stimulus packages to jumpstart their economies. Now that growth is returning, we must design policies to power development that is sustainable both socioeconomically and environmentally. A green investment strategy is not just the best way to get us there. It's the only viable way of doing so. To get there, what we recommend are a range of ambitious long-term policies that address broad goals, not just individual projects. First, we must create and apply regulatory frameworks, tax codes, fiscal policy that encourage investment in renewable energy, electromobility, and clean, resilient infrastructure. 
we have worked with public and private sector partners on more than 50 electromobility initiatives in nearly 19 countries. And so far, we've helped deliver over 600 clean buses in 14 cities. Few people might know this, but Chile has over 800 electric buses already, and this is the largest fleet of its kind outside of China. And this is a model that we expect to scale in the region and model everywhere. Second, our policies must be aligned with decarbonization frameworks and be based on the and national determined contributions to comply with the Paris Agreement. And the NDCs are a huge issue that we plan to discuss also when we join the COP26 conversation. We know that combating climate change requires an all hands on deck, whole of institutional view and approach. Increasingly, government officials and industry leaders understand the scope of the challenge and the need to scale up investment faster than ever. That makes it crucial to demonstrate that going green will create jobs, high quality jobs. And we know that this is the case, and now this is our effort to get the word out to everyone. Going green means job growth. With good policies and job creation, the energy transition can be successful. A new projection by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics showed that two of the top three fastest, fastest growing jobs over the next decade will be in renewable energy. This includes jobs, for example, such as a wind turbine service technician, where we can see a lot of growth in a lot of countries in the region today. We estimate moving to net zero carbon emissions could provide 15 million net jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean over just the next 10 years. And all of this sound could seem like a very tall task or a very big challenge, but the region is exceptionally well positioned to transition to renewables. Just consider its vast amount of resources to include water, we're talking about a region where it has the world's cheapest renewable electricity and the largest resources of copper and lithium reserves, which are essential for building wind turbines, empowering electric vehicles, and creating solar panels. South America alone is home to the lithium triangle where we have two thirds of the world's lithium resources. And this is a huge boon and a huge opportunity for everybody. To create green jobs, we also must pursue policies that make it easier for companies to train workers in renewable energy construction, maintenance, and operation. This includes offering incentives to retain workers, to upskill them, who are currently working in carbon intensive sectors. Legal and policy frameworks also are a factor, and we must make it easier and less expensive to invest, not just in clean power generation and transmission capacity, but also all of this critical skills training. Now, what is the problem? Surging oil and gas prices, as we saw natural gas hit a seven-year high just in the United States alone. In Europe, it increased 60% in August. We're seeing in China, coal prices are soaring, energy crunches everywhere, and this is directly affecting everybody, including factory outputs and increased blackouts. And what is the solution? A renewed focus on how project finance today on responsible energy transition can be done and how we can do it quickly. We at the IDB see this as a priority to improve environments for the investments to flow, to facilitate processes so businesses have greater interest in moving to Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is how we can seize the moment and help our countries invest in this energy transition. Doing so will help us ensure a Build Back Better strategy that does advance transition. So I've spoken a little bit about the importance of investment, but what is the outlook for investment in our region today? And what is it that we want to say about a net zero future? Now globally, to ensure a climate safe future, the world needs to triple annual investment in renewables to 800 billion through 2050. And this is according to the International Renewable Energy Agency. But to get there, we need to dramatically increase the availability of financing in the region. And this is where we play a key role. And this requires more funding from multilaterals, not just the IDB, and from other outside private sector actors as well. We need donors, we need creative minds to come and work and think with us about how we can develop creative new financial solutions to this problem that we're all facing. Now ultimately, in addition to increased financing, governments also must set ambitious renewable energy targets and enact policy frameworks that incentivize the long-term and sustainable development. Countries that set clear, stable policies and rewards will see investments and they will see growth. Now, to accelerate this transition, we are partnering with the private sector. Earlier this year, we actually launched a private sector coalition that started with 40 companies. We are now at quadruple that, over 160 companies with whom we are working to build on a sustainable recovery for the region that includes a lot of dedication of effort and work on climate change. We're also doing pioneering work in sustainable bonds and using innovative blockchain technology to ensure that funding is actually used to support sustainable growth. In addition, we have committed to a floor of 30% climate financing by 2023 ensuring over $5 billion in annual support for climate action. 
We are deploying and we are also developing financial tools to accelerate private sector financing for climate action to include blended finance, more green bonds, guarantees and other de-risking mechanisms where we can do a lot more with, with all of you who are watching today. Now, we also have our NDC Invest platform. What is this? This platform helps countries find resources that they need to translate climate commitments into finance projects. And this includes more than 330 projects in almost every country that we work with in the region. Given the severity of the climate emergency and the need for sustainable recovery, we are establishing our own climate facility, and I'm really excited about this because it's, it's not taken very long. It's been lightning speed one year, and we've been able to design and develop what will be the first of its kind owned by a regional MDB. We're also helping countries design and structure the sale of catastrophe bonds to help minimize the impact of natural disasters. The IDB created a regional platform for finance ministers in the region to exchange knowledge and support concrete advances on climate change policy. And this is something that we also plan to discuss during the COP26 in Glasgow shortly. And just this week, we announced the formation of a new partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation to create a financing instrument dedicated to expanding energy access, supporting green energy transition, and creating jobs, all dedicated to Latin America and the Caribbean. I am very, very proud that the IDB is working to be more aggressive on climate change, even among our fellow MDBs, with whom we work very well together, I should say. But we at the IDB want to be the pioneers. We want to be on the leading edge of what it means to be focused on climate change and on net zero initiatives. We want to use our financial instruments. We want to develop new ones so we can continue to support the region. So before concluding, I'd also like to mention that we are also acting on behalf of 12 countries in Latin America as a technical secretariat for the Renewables in Latin America and Caribbean initiative known as RELAC, another initiative that I personally am very invested in and I think has been phenomenal for the bank. This is the first of its kind in the region aimed at tracking and achieving sustainable energy targets. The main goal for RELAC is to increase the share of renewable energy and the region's power sector from 58% to date to nearly 70% by 2030. And these are the kinds of targets and the kind of ambition that are crucial to have tangible progress on climate change. We know that increasing the share of renewable energy by just 10 percentage points can reduce carbon emissions by 15%. That gets us a lot closer to fulfilling our Paris Agreement. Clearly, to get to net zero, we need to do much more in terms of political commitments and investment. I've outlined a whole bunch that we can discuss after I'm, I conclude my remarks. And there are countries in the region that are seeking a recovery that is green and that a transition to ener an energy transition that's effective and efficient and fast. But climate resilient growth takes time and it takes creativity. For it to be sustainable and inclusive, it takes working with partnerships with MDBs like ourselves and with others. At the IDB, we are working nonstop to help countries go green. We are helping them create and enact plans to embrace technological change, to improve their regulatory frameworks, and to mobilize private sector investment. And we invite all of you today and tomorrow to join us. I think one of the key challenges is going to be workforce development um, because um, the, the need to create green jobs is definitely there and we see it in, in the developed world. But one of the biggest challenges is going to be creating those jobs and opportunities in countries in Latin America, the Caribbean. What are some of the uh, challenges you see and maybe some of the potential opportunities that the bank has to help uh, move the needle in that area? Sure. I think the biggest challenge, frankly, is framing climate change as, as not an issue that can be attended to at some point in the future, but an issue that is actually integral to the creation of jobs today. I think a lot of countries in the region, and then they're starting to put together plans over the long term of what does their economic recovery to look like. And climate change needs to be def well defined for governments who need to make tough choices, who, are, who would prefer budget support rather than dedicate money to environmental initiatives. Jobs, for us at the bank is a key focus and a, an anchor for the Vision 2025. And so for us, the challenge is how do we frame job growth and climate as, as a formula? So that's big challenge number one, and I would say the biggest one today. I think in terms of, of bringing investment into the region, there are some countries that recognize that the investment that they've made in renewables and in, in, in the incipient energy transition that they're trying to engage in has provided significant economic benefits. I think where we can play a role as an institution is helping bridge the gap where they, they need to see more tangible impacts in those communities where these projects are happening. And I think where we need to do a better job as an institution, as a bank, is building those bridges with those communities to ensure that they are aware that they have access to these upskilling opportunities so that the governments can see 
that this is touching the very people that are coming out on the streets mm -hmm. uh, and, and complaining about the lack of access to services and jobs. I think another big challenge, just you know, talking about the issue of jobs is informality. And I think going green in terms of making sure that you know, we need to get the workforce trained up and the workforce focused on this sector, we need to think about the need for labor formalization. And I think framing conversations on the need to create creative opportunities to advance and increase that percentage of labor formality, we're at nearly 76% of labor informality with the COVID impact. Bringing that down will require retraining and upskilling that doesn't mean the traditional routes of training and education. And I think integral to this is another conversation that we can talk about later on education and what we at the bank see as the wave of the future in terms of how we're going to approach training the next generation, training our own generation. Um, we're, we're looking at not only initiatives on the green sector, but we're also talking about silver economy. What does that look like? You know, have, we have an entire workforce who was retired who might need to go back to work because of the economic impact. How can we bring them in with their skill sets to work in these new economies that could provide significant recovery for the, for the countries we're talking about? Thank you. So let's, let's talk about education. You know, you spoke in, uh, earlier about the number of um, students in Latin America, both K through 12 and college, that were disconnected during COVID. Not everybody has access to, um, to internet or broadband. And so many of them have fallen behind. Um, what opportunities do you see for the bank to partner with member countries and with um, um, subnationals in the private sector to try to bridge that gap? I think what we're doing right now, there's two initiatives I like to talk about. In terms of education, our, our division at the bank that's focused on this sector has done a phenomenal job of designing a new education framework that actually focuses with the COVID context on the need to revamp how we look at curriculum in the region, how schools are designed, how we get teachers trained up so that they can handle the new wave of the use of technology in classrooms, um, first part. Second part is under an initiative that we just launched in the last year called IDB Academy. We're actually expanding our network of relationships with academic institutions to see how we can use our technical know-how and skills and resources, uh, work with academic institutions so that we can actually start to deploy into rural areas, areas that are, have long been economically depressed, don't have access to the same types of educational services. So we can start to create pilot programs and discuss how we can get kids in school, how we can get high schoolers upskilled. Up um, we're talking about vocational training that could start in the high school time frame. So we're trying to figure out how we can do this together with academic institutions who also recognize that there's a gap in terms of the educational system in the region. And then lastly, I would say that private sector is critical. I can say firsthand that since I joined the bank, the private sector has been really interested in having discussions with us because they have that value added. It's not only part of their corporate social responsibility mindset, but they fill a gap in terms of financing that governments can't provide. And so what we're trying to do is find those opportunities to work with companies like Microsoft, for example, on technology who can help us build curriculum that touch all of the grades that we're talking about, K through 12 and beyond, in terms of getting training, getting schooling to areas that haven't, haven't really had that access, or that COVID has brought about that they had access in a traditional setting, but not in the new normal. 